Hey, everybody, welcome to episode six of the Trending Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Broad. So excited to be here with you today. This episode is going to be a special treat for you. If you've been listening to our podcast, episode five was all about our No God series. It's been trending here at King's Church. Took a really deep dive, had a lot of great discussion. We found, man, we could have talked for a really, really long time on that. So we wanted to give you this episode as a special follow-up. This featuring Pastor Mark Clark from the Village Church in Vancouver, British Columbia on this episode. And this this talk that you're going to hear today is the first time it's ever been released for public consumption. This is a talk with Pastor Brent Ingersoll that he did an interview with Mark Clark at our XY Men's Conference just a couple months ago. And they talked about Mark Clark's book, The Problem of God, which talks about apologetics and theology and all sorts of amazing content. It's an incredible book. If you haven't read it, you should get it. The Problem of God, look it up. You'll hear a lot about it in this episode of the podcast today. But we want to let you guys know that, uh, man, this is going to be an amazing help to you in your faith journey, and you're going to learn a ton if you lean in. So without further ado, enjoy this interview with Pastor Brent Ingersoll and Pastor Mark Clark from the Village Church. Privilege to have you here. So Mark released a book last year called The Problem of God. And uh, I immediately liked it, not just because it was your book, but uh, I'm an A.W. Tozer fan. And that, The Problem of God is from an A.W. To- a. A. Tozer quote. There's a, there's a meaning behind it. Why'd you pick that title? Um, because I, it has this, yeah, the, the, the quote on the back by Tozer is, all of the problems of heaven and earth, though they were to confront us together and at once, would be nothing compared with the overwhelming problem of God. That he is, what he is like, and what we as moral beings must do about him. So, I mean, that's the thing. We got to figure that out. And so I loved the idea that it was a problem in the sense of, like um, a math equation to be solved, like a math problem where God can actually in some way be solved in regard to rationale and following um, reason, not just faith, to actually deduce that it's more plausible in the marketplace of ideas that God exists than he doesn't. And then the deeper question of, okay, but what God? And that's what the book kind of delves into is these kind of 10 major questions about, um, about Christianity specifically that I explored as a 19-year-old being confronted with somebody coming to me in woodworking class when I'm 19, never walked into a church so I was 19 and telling me about Jesus and then me exploring as an evidential thinker, what about the history? What about the philosophy? What about the literature? What about the archaeology? What about the science uh, to deduce that Christianity really is the best idea in the marketplace yeah. of ideas? And so... Uh, problem in the sense of a math equation yes. but then also the kind of double entendre of problem in the sense of god actually is a problem for people like, yeah and that's they don't what like Tozer, the concept yeah like that should do your 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 calvinist heart really well <laughs> uh that tozer what tozer was getting at is yes you know i think yeah like all the problems in heaven and earth yes you think are big but then in actuality if there is a god that is the primary problem right. all of us have got to deal with yeah is the fact that there is a God, what do you do with that? Yeah. Um, that's, I, lo- I love it. So let me ask you this. So you, you, you hinted towards it just a minute ago, like, and you probably tell some more of your story tonight and stuff, but um, you, know, you grew up in an atheistic home, yeah. and you, you kind of had to really dig into this stuff on your own. What, for you, was your primary hang-up early on with like, Christians and people of faith um, what's what for you? What was the the main? <laughs> this is a long is list. The, yeah. You know your biggest no intellectual. Let's yeah, let's intellectual, not go like yeah. philosophical or. Well, or, the second half of the book is actually moralistic. So there's the you got the you got the evidential kind of philosophical scientific stuff, but then you have the moralistic questions, which are oftentimes in our culture some of the bigger ones. I don't like Christians. Hypocrisy, hell, sex. You know these things. The the reason behind the reason for people, and that as an 18, 19 year old kid who grew up in a very skeptical home, was probably half the reason I didn't believe in Christianity. It was like I don't want to become a Christian because what it's going to do to my sex life. Because what do you do as an eighteen year old right. kid? You know, yeah. uh, and when you're in high school, other than smoke weed and party with girls, that's what I wanted. So when Christianity confronts you, Did you, you got, say like, what do you do as an eighteen year old kid, just in general, or if like, you, I, yeah, I, I what, what I do you do as an eighteen year old kid who doesn't know Jesus, other than? Is. <laughs> All right, yes, I, yeah, yeah, well, hopefully. I, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, but... Yeah, I didn't yeah, do that, Mark. You know, let's pretend that it's much different for church kids, but yeah, it, it probably is. isn't. Um, and so the reality is, right, it was the hypocrisy of the church. It was the hypocrisy of the church. It was the fact that I thought in my brain... When I walk into a church, it's the, the average age is going to be 100. It's going to be orange shag carpet and smell like mothballs. And I walked into a church, and it was exactly your, like that. That was the first, first church I ever walked into. But there was a hot girl doing worship music, and I was like, boom, I love Jesus. Bring me here again. 
All right. And then I married her, which was, by God's grace, very That's cool, amazing. actually. So yeah. That, so, uh, hang, uh, anyways. No more hang ups. Yeah, yeah. So, no more hang ups. Yeah. That was enough to convince me that God is real. So, oh, this girl's hot and she'll love me. All right. So, so anyway, you know, but there was the, there was the science stuff. Uh, yeah. which we can get in more specific. There's a philosophical stuff. There's a psychological stuff. I'm an evidential thinker. I've been an evidential thinker my whole life. I grew up, my family, uh, my dad was a hard, hard atheist. Um, I opened the whole book by telling the story. So my brother's name is Matthew. He's four years older than me. Um, and my dad said, my mom wanted to call my brother Matthew. And my dad was such an ardent atheist. He said, I don't want any kind of biblical names. So he said, if you call him Matthew, spell his name with one T, because I don't want it to be biblical. So they, literally my brother's name on the license is Matthew with one T. Four years later, they had me and called me Mark. So literally the guy did not see the irony in this and he had never what's, picked up a Bible in his life. If I had another brother, it'd be like, hey, Luke. What's your middle right? name? Yeah, but Andrew. Yeah, I saw that on your license because you had to send it yeah, for the car rental. And my like brother's middle name is James. So we have four disciples between the two of us. Anyways, my dad had never picked up a Bible before in his life. He just knew he didn't like Christianity. So, so that was the world I lived in. Uh, no church, no Bible, no prayer, not even Christmas Eve and Easter. None of that. None of that nonsense at all. Uh, and uh, so I, first time I walked in, I was 19. But I gave my life to Jesus when I was 17 uh, or 18 and then just studied by myself for two years. Read the Bible, studied the philosophy, studied the science, studied the history, and got convinced that this was the best uh, so then I started to tell people about Jesus and, uh, I started telling people in my town, they'd be sitting out in a park getting hammered, you know, 10 guys at once. And I'd be like, you know, smoking my cigarettes and okay, listen, I need to tell you about Jesus. All right. <laughs> and I would tell them about Jesus. And I would baptize them in the, in Lake Ontario. I grew up in Toronto, uh, at two o'clock in the morning. I remember baptizing a few guys at two o'clock in the morning. This was before I was baptized. So this goes just a, this is bad ecclesiology. Yeah, um, and uh, anyways, baptism yeah, just, here. just, yeah, two years before I'm ever baptized, I'm baptizing people. Um, anyways, so, so, so that was my, yeah, I, I ventured into these questions, delved deep and realized there was great answers. You had to start def defending the faith you had with your, with your friends. And I think that's where yeah. a lot of these guys, you know, that, you know, out, out in the world, you're, you've got a person at work. They're like, hey, you're a Christian. You know, well, what, what do you do with this? What, in your experience, whether it was with your friends or pastoring your own community, Mark, Mark's the pastor of a church called the Village Church in Vancouver. Uh, it's the fastest, it's got it, the fastest growing church in all of Canada. When did you plan it? Like eight years ago? Uh, 2010, January yeah. 2010. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Like there are five, six, seven thousand people uh, not, it's, it will come to this church. Like it's crazy. So the guy that's never been baptized is doing this. So it's, it's amazing. <laughs> but uh, what do you find? What do you find? You've been baptized, I think. I've right, been I'll, baptized I'll I got now. Right I've been baptized okay. since then. Okay. Uh, I'm a Baptist. So what are you going to do? I can't believe you have not been baptized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not your Libre? No. Right. All right. Uh, yeah. Have you, so when, you, when it comes to the, the, the people you pastor, the, the friends you had, what was kind of the, the most common problem that people have with the, the intellectual you know, now? Just, or, just in general, like what's the one, what's the well, one thing you face the most when it's like, hey, yeah, I know you're a Christian, but what do you do with this? What's the, what's the most common? Well, you have the, the ones that, this is my point. You have the ones that they cite, which are science. Science has disproved Christianity, okay? Uh, so there's two dichotomies. There's dumb people. There's, there's the classic dichotomy, right? There's, there, you're on, you're on, uh, you're on the, the news and you have two screens and you have the philosopher from Oxford uh, who's a scientist and a biologist, yes. and he, of course, is an atheist and a naturalist. And then you have the Christian, and the Christian's from some swamp in Mississippi, and he's got four <laughs> teeth, and, uh, and, you know, so plead your case, guys, yeah. right? And then, so Christianity is immediately posited as something for dumb people right. versus naturalism, which is posited for smart people. So that was my whole life growing up. That's every friend and every family member I had. So what I've come to realize is there's all kinds of, of disastrous holes um, in building your life on naturalism, um, not only scientifically, but philosophically. Um, so for instance, um, a couple summers ago, I went home to do my grandmother's funeral and uh, my naturalistic family uh, who, who believes that everything I believe about heaven and hell and the afterlife is based on silly thoughts of an ancient story that's, you know, it's just Mark leads a cult. I'm like, I don't lead a cult. They're like, what did you do today? I'm like, I ate the flesh and drank the blood of a dead man. Okay, <laughs> yeah. good point. Um, does sound odd, but yeah. uh, 
so they, of course, are, you know, like every naturalist uh, atheist, they think that they just walked into the world with a blank slate and they'll only take, they'll only build their worldview based on evidence. They'll only build their worldview based on things that they can factually prove. And then a Christian builds their worldview, of course, on, um, on fancy stories and basically hopeful crutches, you know, during difficult times. So uh, I went home and I, and I looked at them and they, and they said something very interesting. They said, um, at least she's not suffering anymore. And I thought that was a very interesting statement because that's a metaphysical belief about the afterlife. And so I said to them, well, how do you know she's not suffering more? How do you, what, what tells you that she's not, w w based on what? You, that was a metaphysical statement. That was a faith position you just gave me. Right. She's not suffering anymore. But how do you know that? Yeah. You've never been to the afterlife. That's a faith position you have. See, everybody has a faith position. The question is, uh, what do you base your faith position on? Right. Is it based on history, philosophy, literature, science, um, the testimony of thousands of years, you build your worldview on that or do you build your worldview on sitting around the dinner table just thinking up stuff that feels good one yeah. moment, f doesn't feel good the next. Listen, we have a massive contradictory philosophical culture that I was literally golfing with a guy who wanted to tell me, I talk about the idea of the problem of exclusivity in the book, the idea that Jesus is the only way. Of course, that's one of the massive problems, yep. right? Yep. And so, uh, he looks at me, he says, you're a pastor and we're golfing and yeah, I'm a pastor. We're in Palm Springs. I'm like, hey, look, um, I, I don't know you, but I think Jesus is the only way. And by whole three, he's just perturbed by this concept. Yeah. And they, oh, I can't believe you believe that. Don't you know that that's going to create wars? Don't you know that's going to create violence? Don't you know that there's bad things that happen when people believe in absolute statements like that? And I'm like, okay, so let me ask you a question. I said, uh, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm an accountant. I said, you're an accountant. Okay. So your, your daughter comes home from school. How old is she? Oh, she's in grade two. I said, she's in grade two. So she does a test. And on the test, it was two plus two equals what? And she wrote five. She comes home to you and says, dad, they get, I got it wrong. What are you going to say? Because, you know, she thought it was five and that should be good enough for her. Right. And he said, you know what? You're right. She's not wrong in thinking it's five. If that's what it is for her, then that's what it is. Yeah, come on. That was an actual conversation that I had. And I'm like, dude, now we're just being stupid. All right, now you've built your worldview on something that you want. Like, here's, here's the reality. We're all getting along, but we're sacrificing truth for it. That's the worst sacrifice you can make. Right. Because we're all sitting around the table and we're not arguing. But listen, if Uncle Joe at the Christmas table is crazy and thinks the world is flat and man has never been to the moon, all right, if you're that guy... We should all not just sit around and go, yeah, Uncle Joe, you're yeah. totally right. The world's flat. Let's all continue eating turkey. Yeah. You're going to go, Joe, you're nuts. Knock it off. <laughs> I don't want my kids to hear that. All right? They're going to think that's actual fact. Hey, we have any flat earthers here? Any flat earthers? Yeah, flat earthers. All right. I there you go. All right. You can leave. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're crazy. Uh, yeah. No, just <laughs> Anyways, the point is, is we got to go after truth even when it makes us uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, that's and right. And exclusivity is the thing. Of, co of course, we all exclude. Listen, yeah. I um, when I wear a wedding ring, ring, ring around, this is this is exclusivity. Yeah. This is a symbol of yeah. I'm not gonna sleep with you because I have a wife. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's not a bad thing. Yeah. And our culture has bought into this concept that no, uh, your truth is your truth, my truth yeah. is my truth. And whatever you, because we all want to get along. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, we can, we can, on the one hand, we should fight. Here's the, here's the d distinction I make. There is, um, there's pluralism. There's, there's uh, ethical pluralism, cultural pluralism, which is beautiful, right? We should all live with Muslims and Hindus and, and atheists and agnostics. And actually, we should fight for their right to believe what they believe as Christians. We should totally do that. We yeah. should work with people who we disagree with to accomplish great things culturally. Absolutely. Yep. But, so it's cultural pluralism. But then there's metaphysical pluralism, which we make a leap into not only, hey, should I fight for your right to believe what you believe? But now we've jumped into a world where we say, and the fact that you believe it makes it right yeah and that's the problem yes yeah. no we need to be able to sit down with our muslim friends and hindu friends and go no 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 your story is not actually based on history here's a better story in the marketplace of ideas right. or our agnostic friends or atheist friends that actually challenge them because here's the thing either a muslim's right or a christian's right right an atheist is right or a hindu is right they can't both be right at the same time truth is exclusive by its nature by its nature yeah yeah, yeah absolutely that's and the, the and so that's one of the biggest challenges that, that I think we face, I, I face mean, growing up and we face in Canada. I think that's the biggest challenge, not just in the conversation of, of faith,
but just morality and humanity now is this like yeah. the, the erosion of of lines of people being able to say like no a dude's a dude and a girl's a girl i don't care how you feel right, right? like that that stuff's that stuff's coming coming against more than just more than just faith um so one of the biggest hangups people have actually let, let, let me let me go back one more on that because i don't want to miss that let's just role play for a second so i come to you and i say you know for these guys like if i if if they're at work or whatever and i come to you and i say hey man like you you're a person of faith i'm a person of, i believe in science like what's what's the, what's the quick retort to that well i'm i'm a person of science too so um i follow where the evidence goes and then i make deductions based on where the evidence goes right. so so um, the classic narrative 50, 60 years ago um, was that as civilizations get more technologically and scientifically advanced, orthodox religion will die. That was the narrative. Uh, if you watch Star Trek, like the original Star Trek, um, there's no religions in, in the Star Trek of the 1960s because the thought was in the future, religion will not be a thing anymore. If you watch The Next Generation, there's all kinds of religion. Because by the 90s, people started to realize that religion actually wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. That the deeper science delved into what it did, either on a biology level, on a cos cosmological yeah. level, yeah. On, a, on the theory of mathematics level. Evidence kept rising for theistic belief versus away from it. Right. And so... Um, so the idea, for instance, that philosophers thousands of years ago would talk about the fact that if something begins to exist, it has to have a cause, yep. right? Yep. So anything that begins to exist, it's a very important point, has to have a cause. Um, what philosophers would say is, well, God never began to exist, so he doesn't need a cause. But then people would say, well, we don't need to take an extra step and talk about God because we know that the universe uh, is the eternal, uncaused, non-contingent reality. It's not contingent on anything before it existing at all. It's always been. Yeah. And for thousands of years, that was the debate. That was the deduction. The universe is the eternal thing. Until, of course, uh, the 1920s and 30s, when Edwin Hubble looked through his telescope and realized that, no, actually, all matter, space, time, energy came into existence in a single moment yeah. 15 billion years ago. And now that we know that the universe had a birthday, the, the question gets raised. If everything that begins to exist has to have a cause, the universe began to exist. Ergo, the universe has to have a cause. Yeah. As science has delved into it, it's created all these massive existential questions about the existence of God, not away from him, but toward him. Yeah, which was the purpose of science in the first place, was it not? Like science was... Yeah was developed by believers. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And the university is a 12th century Christian invention. Yeah. Harvard, yeah. Brown, Princeton, Yale, yeah. all of them were all based on uh, Christian, because it's the Christian, it's the Christian, this is what I talk about in one of the chapters, it's the Christian um, matrix of ideas that actually allows the scientific method to be born. It's the, con you can't, if you're an animist, for instance, an animist is like, you know, you believe that there's spirits in the trees, yeah, okay, yeah. like avatar philosophy. Yeah. So, so if you're, if you have that philosophy, or, or First Nations, right, yeah, there's still yeah, a belief in that. Yeah. So, if that's your philosophy, you can't poke and prod trees and put them through uh, scientific exec because there's spirits in there. Right. All right. So you have all these. If back in Greco-Roman philosophy, that philosophy is not going to give way to science because why? Why is the water stirring up? Because Poseidon is is mad and he's swirling the waters around. Just it was Christian deductions about creation and order and the repetition of hypothesis that actually created the reality of science in the first place. The so Christian, the Christian framework actually, sh it should work us to seek to know God more. Yeah. Whereas a lot of the pagan understanding, basically God was just this write off where it's like, Oh, yeah. I have to ask that question because yeah, obviously God, there's lots right? of gods. There's lots of, you know, things going on and they're all crazy and they're all fighting each other. And, or, uh, you don't have a, a mandate where some see within Christianity, if creation has order, which is something that was vastly very interesting in the, in the Christian world, birthed the idea of order. Yep. 
if you have order, um, then what you can do is you can do a test and you can get the same result over and over, which is, you know, the, the whole scientific method is based yeah. on this. Um, but if the world is chaos, which is kind of the Babylonian reality, the creation came out of these two gods fighting and, yeah. you know, then, then you, there's no point in doing hypothesis of verification and observation. There's no point in doing any of that because you're going to have different results. It's not going to prove anything. Right. So it was Christian philosophy and, and, uh, that actually created the scientific method to begin with. And then, of course, science has gone on to prove the order and the reality of God's existence. Uh, but, of course, so science kind of sits there, and it can either be used for theism or it can be used for naturalism and atheism. But you've got to stretch it a little more to be able to use it for, for atheism. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I, that's what I always find when I get talking to an atheist is, bro, you have more robust faith than I do because I, right. I can't stretch that far. Right. Yeah. Let me ask you this question. So a lot of people, a lot of people will come and one of their big hangups will be, you know, uh, the, a lot of Christians will try to engage in like a faith conversation with a non-believer. Someone has questions and they'll say, you know, they'll quote the Bible where most people aren't coming in to say, what does the Bible say? Sure, Therefore, yeah. I'm going to believe. Right. What, how, 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 what's the process, you know, for people like me who, who grew up in church I was, I was brought to faith through the Bible, through that culture, but most people nowadays are, are coming in and the Bible right. is something you receive after as authoritative. Right. You know, what, how, do you, how do you process the Bible? Why do you trust the Bible? And what role does that have in us navigating those conversations with like our, our non-believing friends or family or coworkers? Well, yeah, I, I, I don't think you necessarily start with the Bible says because they don't care what the Bible says. Yeah. The Bible supports uh, slavery, the Bible's oppressive, the Bible's ancient, the Bible's born out of some, you know, ancient that, Near East culture. That's what, that's what they're coming with, yeah, that's, generally. They, yeah, I'm yeah. not saying that's my belief, I'm a pastor. Yeah. <laughs> just, Jeepers, just, Brent, follow along, I think yeah. they're getting it. Okay, okay. Brent's having an existential like, crisis uh, up here. He's like, why did I invite this guy? You gonna let this guy uh, preach at my <laughs> church tomorrow? Uh, yeah. uh, so, <laughs> so no, that's what they're saying in okay. their brain, right? Yes, so there's I no guess. point sitting, you well, know, at you. the coffee shop and going, hey, well, you know, John 3 says this. Now, there does come a point where John 3 is going to massively explode their heart and their life and their mind. Yes. Always, of course, and, and, and it's the scriptures that are going to actually have that power. But um, to begin with, I always start with what are their major hangups and then start to talk about the logic and the rationale behind those hangups. And my core responsibility, at least mine anyway, I feel, um, um, is to, is to deconstruct their worldview and show them that they've based their life on a worldview that doesn't actually work in the end. So for instance, um, if they come to me and they say, um, there's too much evil and suffering in the world, okay, which is a massive reason that people don't believe yeah. in Christianity. So um, I'll begin to explore with them. Okay, well, every, that's not a Christian problem. First off, that's a, that's a, that's any worldview has that problem. So if you're an agnostic or you're an atheist and you say, right. um, there's too much evil and suffering in the world. My pushback to you is where did you, uh, I had this conversation with, uh, my cousin actually about, um, uh, about a year or so ago, he, he's an ardent atheist. Like one of these like jacked up, like Mark, what you do is the dumbest thing on the planet atheist, like hardcore. So, um, there was a shooting in a school, shot up a bunch of people. And he posted on Facebook, uh, where was God during the school shooting? He was where he's always been, which is nowhere because he doesn't exist. Okay. That's classic atheist, you know, mentality. Right. They, they clearly have not thought beyond A, B, C deduction. So then I pushed back on, on B and I premise and I said, um, let me ask you a question. Where did you get the concept that shooting up a, a room full of people was wrong? Right. Who told you that? To which he said, well, what, what do you mean? I said, well, why, you know, if naturalism is true and all of our morality was wired into our brains cognitively through hundreds of thousands of years of development, then, then there, you know, there's things in, 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 um, in, in the world of an, the animal kingdom that you and I believe are wrong that we never would have deduced would be absolutely wrong if we are only a development of animals. Like, you know, a, a praying mantis female after she's had sex with the male will just rip his head off We're done. just done i'm done with you thank right? you Which sir is probably what some of the women in our culture would probably do because yeah, they're kind of done with us after familiar, they've it? used you for what you, you need to have children so <laughs> yeah. she'll just rip the head off all right now somewhere along the line we said oh no that's wrong ladies should not rip the head of their husband off especially after sex yeah but yeah. if you, but yeah. if 
But if nature is the only thing that deduced morality through hundreds of thousands, there was a girl who, uh, her name's Melissa Drexler. I tell the, to tell the story um, where she had a, she went to a, uh, a high school dance in New Jersey in the 90s, uh, went into the bathroom, had a baby, strangled it to death, threw it out in the garbage can, and then went back to, to the dance. Everybody started freaking out. This is wrong. This is bad. I can't believe Melissa. Did. Where are we out of society? Steven Pinker, who's an evolutionary naturalist, uh, Darwinian philosopher, wrote an article in the New Yorker a couple weeks later. And he said, you know what? Why is everyone beating up on Melissa Drexler? Here's the thing. All she did is she did what our grandmothers have had to do for hundreds of thousands, millions of years, which is you have to kill the weakest in the litter so the strongest survive. Infanticide is not a moral problem. It's the most natural thing we could do. Actual quote. Actual quote. Yeah. So here's the thing. I mean, you could go through. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show them their own worldview. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Stephen, holes in it. The holes in it. Yeah. So Stephen Pinker also wrote a, um, an article where he, he argued that rape is – a natural part of life because what did, okay, so in a naturalistic philosophy, of course, your only premise is to get your seed into the next generation. That's right. what animals do, right? right? They eat and they have sex and that's it. That's how they're wired. And so, which, some, which at a men's conference seems like, yes, well, yes, 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 kind of what, is there something else? Yeah. All right, so, uh, so, so the reality is that's all you do, man. You're just trying to get your genes into the next generation yeah. of gene pools. So, so what they said is, what did ugly men do hundreds of thousands of years ago? Well, they couldn't do anything yeah. but rape a woman in order to get their seed into the next generation. Right. And so their quote is, rape is as natural as spots on a leopard or the giraffe's elongated neck. So you have to push back against people who have that philosophy and say, your, act, your, your worldview is actually pathetic. And so you're coming at me thinking I'm, I'm dumber than you. But most The reality people, is, go ahead. Most, but just on that, keep that thought. But most people don't even think about, they don't, they don't take that channel of thinking out to that point where the, the leading minds in atheistic thought or evolutionary, you yeah, know, like they they're, don't, being, they're being honest. Yeah, they're being honest, but most people who would subscribe to that no, don't no, realize no. This, is, this is actually the chain of no, reason here. No, no, most people in our culture, and this is what I push back against every week at my church, most people in our culture just um, explore their worldview like a buffet, and they'll just take a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and then when that doesn't work, they'll sacrifice that, they'll move over here, they'll put potatoes in the plate. They just do whatever they want, right? and it's suiting their own life, which Soren Kierkegaard said is the ultimate scary slavery is when... You are a slave to your feelings and you're a slave to what you think is a good worldview. And anytime something pushes against it, you just go, no, you reject it outright. Uh, that's the scariest place to be because you're a slave and you don't even know it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's huge. So you, you hit so, on... So my point is pragmatically for us, I think the first move is to show them the weakness of their own worldview yeah. and, and cause them to need a different worldview in order to live their life in regard to the major questions of origins, meaning, morality, and right. destiny. Be able to force them to have to come up with a different philosophy. Because yeah. you can't take karma with the question of evil and suffering. Because, um, so the atheist problem with evil and suffering is clear. The karma philosophy of, I mean, if you take Hinduism and you deal with evil and suffering, the re I was in India. And so I'm traveling in India. There's a, a woman um, out on the street begging with a baby saying, please feed my baby, please feed my baby. I went to give her money and our guide said, do not relieve her suffering because she need." here's what karma says. She needs to actually repay the karmic reality for her suffering in this life or she'll have to redo it in the next life. So leave evil and suffering aside and let people deal with it. Well, is that the philosophy the guy across the table is going to have? No, he's not. He's going to, no, we should relieve the suffering. Well, Christianity is the one worldview that actually makes you do that. Yes. So you're saying, you know, whether it's the problem of evil and suffering or, you know, the, the question of creation and why are we here, all that, you know, number one thing to do is to, to, to push back on uh, the holes worldview. in their worldview. Yes. Let them even see they have one. Yeah. And then lead towards, like, I think evil and suffering, I want to talk about that for a minute. Like, why, why go a little further? Because I actually had a guy, I don't know if you're here, uh, Josh, I think, um, asked me last night. He's just, just feeling this thing out, this following Jesus thing. And he's like, I, I don't understand why, you know, bad things happen to good people. The, the classic evil and suffering question. Why in the marketplace of ideas does Christianity stand 
shoulder, head and shoulders above all the other religions, atheism included? Um, well, partly because of what I just said. Atheism doesn't have a good answer because um, really, they, so here's the thing. When people, when an atheist looks at me and says there's too much evil and suffering in the world, I push back and say, where did you even get the category called evil and suffering by which you're putting God on trial. If there is no such thing as objective reality, yes. then there is no such thing as evil and suffering. There's only stuff going on. There's stuff that happens. So who says that flying planes into buildings is evil? Who told you that? Yeah. Nobody told you that. There's no, in the animal kingdom, that wouldn't be wrong. The animal kingdom is red in tooth and claw, man. You yeah. do what you have to do. If you've yeah. got to enslave a race so that you can get ahead, that's a beautiful part of the progress of human species. Yeah. Who, what are you coming at me telling me I'm wrong? Where do you get the wrong? Who told you wrong? No one gets to give me wrong. You can say you don't like it. I don't care what you like. I'll enslave you so that my family gets to survive. That's all I'm trying to do is eat and have sex, man. That's it. What are you coming at me with wrong trying to slow my progress down? Where did you get the concept called evil by which you're putting God on trial saying shooting people in a room is wrong? No one ever told you that, so don't use it to disprove God. Yeah. You need God to tell you that. Yeah, so you're saying the very, the very, like, the, in the question itself. Is a you're flawed actually, presumption. Yes. And, and, and ironically, you're actually making a case for the fact that there is a God. Yeah, the fact that you say there's evil is evidence for the existence of God, not against him. Yes, because if there was no God, there'd be no evil. We wouldn't care. We're a good team. We should start a hip hop group. Yeah, man. <laughs> no, we shouldn't then. Okay. okay, it wasn't very good. Didn't turn out well. No, it didn't. Two, uh, two aging white dudes. Hip hop, no. Um, all right. Let's. Uh, all these guys want to do is eat them. They don't care that we're eating them. They're like, what the crap kind of thing is this? I want to eat them. Let's talk about hypocrisy for a minute. Because I think a lot of people. A lot of people, their, their hang-ups really aren't around maybe God and his existence, yeah. but they'll look at the people of God who claim to know him, and they'll say, well, based on your life, yeah. I, I, I can't believe that there's yeah. a good, good God. Like, yeah. What do you say to that? What's the pro- what, how do you deal with the problem of um, hypocrisy? So the main, the main, if I'm sitting across with someone who says that, the main issue, well, it's a few things. First, um, of course the church is full of a bunch of people who, um, who uh, you know, bring, bring down the name of Christianity for two reasons. First, because the church is full of non-Christians. Jesus told us that, Matthew 7, it's full of false disciples. It's full of people who not, they weren't, he says there's two things going on in Matthew 7. There's false teachers that deceive people, yeah. and then there's people who've been self-deceived. So there's people in this room who think they're Christians and they're not. They were born in church. Uh, got raised in the church, got married in the church, serve in the church, have their funeral in a church, and will wake up in hell because they don't actually know Jesus. They know religion. They know things externally, right? Yes, they wake up eating one of these. So, uh, so there's full of, the church is full of false disciples. So, of yeah. course, of course the church is going to kill a bunch of witches and run around having wars based on nothing because they're not Christians. They're fighting geopolitical wars and, and wrapped up in some kind of way. So, so that's... What, that's not that's even, not generally the problem, though. The problem usually is in the real disciples that... Yes, so there's false disciples, just yeah. people who... Then there's actual Christians who are a complete wreck, which is every one of you, right? You are narcissistic beyond belief, depraved, sinful, wretched, poor, pitiable, blind, naked. I mean, this is all Revelation 3. It's all Jesus, yes. not me. So, <laughs> all right, deal with the Bible if you are offended. You know? um, listen... You are such a disaster. Of course you're going to make mistakes. And I look at people and say, my church is full of these people. Here's the thing you cannot do. Don't judge Christianity based on the people trying to follow Jesus. Judge Christianity based on Jesus. Yes. Right? The people following Jesus. Dostoevsky said it this way. He said this. If, I, if you ask me how to get home, okay, and I point at a path, and I say, that's the way home, yeah. but I'm drunk, yeah. and I'm stumbling along the path, Falling into trees, it doesn't make the way home any less true. Yeah, that happened Wednesday, and I asked you. And yeah, and I was. Just joking, yes. just joking. <laughs> just, <laughs> it doesn't make it less true. It just means I'm stumbling around yeah. trying to figure it out. Yeah. Do not judge your life on me, because yeah. as C.S. Lewis said, one day you're going to stand in front of God. He ain't going to ask you about what you read in some books and what your neighbor did with his life. He's right. going to say, "What did you do? It's your soul I'm worried about." Yeah. So do not judge. 
based on other people's lives, that would be like, here's the analogy I use, it would be like saying that the mathematics of Einstein, here's a category mistake, okay? It's a category mistake. The mathematics of Einstein I'm going to reject because I heard he was a kleptomaniac. He actually was? No. Okay, just hypothetically Come speaking. In. Again, okay. it's just a hypothetical. Right, I, I think you. they're I with me. You. I think you're behind I'm, a bit. I'm, I you're am. Okay. I, you know, I've been talking since 9 a.m., yeah, you're fine. keep you're going. Fine. Yes. So, no, yeah. he wasn't actually a kleptomaniac. I'm saying if you found out he had some yeah. moral defect, yes. okay. do you reject all of his truth claims right. because the guy was a disaster? No. You go, his science still adds up. His math right. still adds up. For a Christian to say, Jesus is the only way, and I'm an utter wreck, and don't follow my, don't, don't, uh, reject Christianity because of the hypocrisy of eight Christians you know. Right. That is the ultimate weak reality. Yeah. That's like rejecting science because your science teacher is, yeah. uh, you know, you found out he's cheating on his wife. But there's a, I mean, and then, you know, for as a Christian, there's a, a very quick connect, almost a judo move, that when someone comes and says, you know, like hip hop, like, like, Exactly what you're saying. Don't reject Christianity based on the person, but look to look to look to Jesus and, and, and judge that. Yeah, then yeah. you hear that the invitation to Christianity actually is for people who are train wrecks. Train wrecks. All of Completely. us. Completely. That's what the church is full of. Yeah. That's what grace is about. That's, That's it. That's the beauty of it. It's not based on being a good person. It's not based on your performance for God. It's based on his performance for you. Yeah. Best, best opportunity to preach the gospel is when someone comes up and says. 100%. Uh, yeah. I have these stats in the book that talk about what Christians statistically do that are the exact same as non-Christians. Uh, based on Barner research about gambling, porn, cheating, lying, uh, going to psychics, drug abuse, all this crazy. It's, all the stats are the same. Which is sad. Which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, the only stat that is different is based on recycling, and atheists recycle more than Christians do. So it's like, <laughs> we've got them yeah. talking about yeah. right now. But I mean, that, it's sad in the sense of, I think we have a, we, Jesus had a more robust idea of what his grace was able to do in the life of a person and actually bring transformation. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's beautiful in the sense of, he did not come to call the healthy, he came to call right. the sick. Yeah. Like, that's the whole point. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, um, let's go another, let's go, uh, here's another one. Um, I, also, I also think there is some, um, some slowing down the tape and, and, um, and working through data with people. So for instance, I talk about the fact that Dan Brown, you know, in Da Vinci Code talks about how the church maybe killed, you know, five million witches during its time. Well, yeah. five million witches would have been like 10% of the population of the entire earth. So it's insane. No historian thinks the church killed 5 million witches. In fact, when you actually do the data, you have a few spots where some witches were killed, others that were imprisoned. And most historians look and go, there were maybe 26 people killed in the so-called witch trials that were the churches out there. Yeah. So you got to slow, it's like these conspiracy theories, right? right? You got to slow the tape down. Everyone calm down yeah. and go, look, there's, there's no, like people go, Stanley Kubrick made a video and pretended we went to the moon and all the, and Buzz Aldrin, who'd actually been on the moon, a guy walked up to him. I saw the video on YouTube and he punches a guy in the face finally. He's just like, he's one of these like, the moon landing never happened. Why are you lying? You're in NASA's pocket, blah, blah. And Buzz oh, Aldrin, Buzz. who's like 200 years old, just goes, bop, you know, you're an idiot. Get out of my face. At some point, you got to slow the tape down. Yes. And just go, let's look at some data, fool. Yeah. Yeah. Like, stop dreaming up numbers out of nothing. No historian even comes close to supporting. This is, this is a narrative that you've gotten from some random Reddit yeah. website, and you base your life on it. There's more, there's more, like, information and ideology. Like, there's cultural, like a cultural vortex right now, like, in, in, the, in the age we live in. What, 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 I think your church is a good testimony to this. What would you say, though, about, like, so for the person where you're like, hey, pump the brakes for a minute. Do you think there's a growing appetite in like North American culture, for instance, in the West that are just kind of starting to see through this like truth is relative, it's subjective, yeah. and, the, and people are getting kind of over the whole like. Yes and no. I think my, Vancouver is uh, an interesting um, city because uh, relativism and uh, tolerance and all those things are always a huge part of the conversation. And that's good in some ways and bad when it's metaphysical. Um, but in other ways, yeah, there's a bit of like, uh, we've been through it generationally and now we're starting to go, where's meaning? Yeah. Where's the meaning of life? If everything's um, true, nothing's true. Right. Suicide's up. Depression's up. 
um, what are we going to do? People are kind of, you know, done with the gray and looking for something, you know, solid. I mean, our church, our church went from 16 people in my house sitting there talking about how we're going to plant a church to what it is now based on the kind of message that says your worldview outside of Jesus will deconstruct, your life will deconstruct. There's nothing that holds up in the face of Jesus better. Um, and he'll give you meaning and purpose and, and give you existential reality. And people are show up to the church and they get saved. Yeah. Uh, their life gets changed. I mean, we did a... We did, okay, so there's people who say these skeptical questions are no longer relevant. Nobody cares about objective reality more. Nobody cares about these kind of challenges toward Christianity and hell and science and history. They just, you know, they, it's kind of a bygone era of modernity. Here's the thing. The last time we did a series on, uh, as a church, on these questions, six or seven questions, uh, we grew by 900 people in a week. And they stayed. Wow. In a week. Yeah, that's crazy. We didn't know what to do with them. In Vancouver. In Vancouver. Yeah. We're like, we don't know what to do with any of you. And so we just looked at them. We said, if you're a Christian, don't come back. Go to find another church. We need these people here. All right? You're just taking up space and energy and sucking resources anyways. Non-contributing zeros. He said it, not me. Anyway, that's my, that's my basic money talk at my church. It really is. I heard. I listened to it. It was. You said what every well, pastor wants to say. How can you attend a church if you know Jesus and you're attending a church and not give? What are you? You're, you're a waste. What are you doing here? You're just taking out. I'm not talking about unchurched people. I'm talking about church people. You think you could keep the lights on and this guy's going to feed his family with you sitting around keeping your money to yourself? Thank you, you break. Man. Go somewhere else. Thanks, man. <laughs> I saw a bunch of churches. I was driving up here. I saw like five churches. Just go there. Yeah, all right, yeah. No, that's my money talk. What? What do you, what do you, what do you? All right, next question. Okay. All right, one talk more. About okay, money. One, one more question, and then uh, we got like 15 minutes left. What I want to do is I'm going to do some Q&A, and I don't feel like eating any more wings, so here's what no. I'm going to do. If you want, no, 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 I got a better idea. Yeah. If you want to ask a question. Oh, you eat a you wing. You got to eat a wing. I like it. You come up, you smash a wing, and you ask the or question. Eat a, at least a bite of a we wing. We might get no questions. I feel like we've got some yeah, people yeah, that want to okay. do it. So it's got to be a question like along these lines of, okay. of apologetics. But here's my last one. Uh, it has to do with, with hell. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, they have a very difficult time under, like, like yeah. wrapping their heads around, you know, the biblical, yeah. theological understanding of hell. And why, why could a loving God send people to hell like what mm. how how do we respond as believers basic kind of approach to this yeah well i think for me i mean personally i think my two biggest uh doubts um in life are um evil and suffering in this one uh partly because it's not a hypothetical for me i had a whole family my dad who was the atheist i talked about earlier died when i was 15. Uh, my stepdad who raised me and came into my life when i was 10. He died not going to Jesus. I'm not sure my nanny knew Jesus. I mean, my whole family, um, they don't know him except my grandfather. And so um, this isn't a hypothetical. Right. If, if Christianity is real and my dad didn't accept Christ, to my knowledge, then my dad is literally in hell right now. So this isn't some kind of philosophical, hypothetical thing. This is real to me. Um, and hell to me um, is it's, it's a problem um, but it's also the minute I have the problem, the problem bites back because I here, here's who has a problem with hell. The only group of people who has a problem with hell are our are, are 21st century, modern, um, enlightened Westerners who sit around Starbucks drinking lattes and philosophizing about what God's allowed to do and not what he's allowed to do. Right. The people who don't have a problem with hell are the people where you go to the villages. I just got back from Uganda. Okay, and you go to the villages of Uganda and you see people who've come in and killed and raped women and children and taken all of their stuff. I can guarantee you when you look at those people and say, don't worry, God is a God of vengeance and he will bring down justice on men who had no justice in this life. Yep. They ain't losing any sleep. They love that. Over the concept of God punishing people. Yes. In fact, they would say God is not worth worshiping. Unless he does this. If he does not do this, he is not just. Yeah. And so the reality is, 
We have these concepts of justice. God says, I'm perfectly vengeful. I do what's right. I'm not you. I don't carry out judgment in ways that aren't exactly proportioned to what they should be. But trust me in my carrying out. If, if you have a rapist, if you have a murderer, we want justice. There's something in your soul that wants to have justice actually happen to that person. You yes. don't want just to get them off. Well, this is the reality of what God does. He brings cosmic Real justice, and if you, listen, walk up to a Palestinian and a, and a Jewish person and say, don't worry, everyone's all going to heaven when we die. You'll all be there. Don't worry about it. Let's see how jacked up they get. Yeah. Just tell a Muslim, hey, don't worry about all the people who've died fighting your holy wars and martyring themselves. Hey, don't worry, everyone's going to the same place. Don't you all know? Yeah. We're all just going, ah, we're all together, kumbaya. What are you yeah. talking about? Yeah. God will, now, that's a Western, that's a very really a Western, Western idea. We're so disproportionately blessed and cushioned. Do you think and that's And we just part of love it? to, from our entitled perspective, philosophize on what God's allowed to do and not do. And God is so much smarter than you on his worst day. And you look at Habakkuk and you look, see, here's the crazy thing. You look at all of those ancient writers, the, the ancient, the, the first century writers, the philosophers, the times before Jesus, they saw far more evil and suffering than we did in yeah. their life. Far more. Like yeah. I'm talking, you, everyone was dead. By the so way, you know, the average lifespan was like 32. All of us are dead. Yeah. The women are dying during childbirth. You have a bunch of kids, five of them out of the nine died. Way more suffering and evil than we ever see. Way, ten times more. And those philosophers, you go back to their writings, none of them say, I see so much evil and suffering, God doesn't exist. None of them. Yeah. They say, there's so much evil and suffering in the world, I must not be smart enough to understand. Until the Enlightenment, when we heightened rationalization and mm -hmm. reason to be the ultimate arbiter of everything that's true, yep. and then we go, oh, my brain should be able to figure out why this exists. And Alvin Plantinga who's said to be the greatest living philosopher in the world, he's a Christian, um, he makes this point. He says, listen, um, let's say you take something like a St. Bernard dog and something called a noceum, which is like this little bug. It's a little insect in the Midwest. And so he said, if you go into a tent and you look into a tent and you ask the question, is there a St. Bernard in this tent? You look around and you wouldn't see it. You go, okay, there must not be. But if you open a tent and you said, is there a noceum in here? Uh, you, would, you would probably be wrong if you just said, I can't see one. And he says, why, when it comes to the question of God and evil and suffering, do we look and we say, um, hey, there's so much evil and suffering in the world, God must not exist like we're looking for a St. Bernard, when the reality is there might be reasons that you cannot understand or cannot see that should humble you before the question rather than deducing, I can't see it, therefore God doesn't exist. Yeah. Why is, why is for the Christian, why, why is hell, in, in one respect, good news why is god's judgment good news what does the gospel have to do like with well that? partly because it doesn't leave it doesn't leave evil and wrongdoing Undone. like my mom my mom doesn't believe in christianity i had a conversation had this conversation my work why do you believe in hell why do you believe in hell so i opened up the newspaper i said okay here's the story this guy uh, raped and killed these four girls buried them in his backyard what do you want to happen to that guy you want him to go to heaven no you want him to just not exist and get away with it his whole life? No, I think he should go to jail. Why do you want him to go to jail? Why does he go to jail for? And it's interesting because people say, well, no, 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 you don't understand because we only sin for 80 years. We shouldn't suffer for eternity. Mm -hmm. Listen, judgment is not evaluated based on how long it took you to do something. It could take me 30 seconds to shoot you and kill you. Yeah. I'll go to jail for, you know, well, in Canada, I'll go to jail for, you know, nine months and, uh, <laughs> and get a law degree. So... Uh, it's not, based, it's not based on how long it took you to commit a crime. It's based on the severity of the crime. Right. So now we're dealing with a God. There's, a, there's, a, um, there's an increase in essence, okay, in, in philosophy. So if, uh, if, let's say I, okay, here's, here's a, if I'm driving down the street and I drive over a, um, a ladybug, okay, is anyone stopping me? No. If I drive over a cat, is anyone stopping me? Probably not. I, probably not. Hopefully it's like a bit of a cheer in the neighborhood, you know, because they're straight from the gates of hell, by the way, cats. Um, all right. And so, but I might get out of my car. I might look around. Oh, my gosh. A neighbor comes out. Oh, I killed a cat. Who is this? And, uh, tough. And they're like, just go. All right. Now, if a little kid runs out and I hit him, I'm probably stopping and figuring it out. Yeah. Right. Because there's a chain of essence. Yes. That we know that kids have a greater essence than cats and ladybugs. Yeah. So when you're dealing with God, 
who is so beyond yeah. when you've wronged him the wrong has a kind of um, judgment to it you've done it every day you didn't just do it once by the way yeah. you wake up every day you know what hell is the expression of not one decision to follow Jesus or not it's the millions of decisions you make every single day to curb your Against soul God. away from him yeah. rather than toward him yeah. echoing out into eternity but here's the thing for a Christian it's also perfectly done to each and every person so it is not the case and i think there's a biblical case for this that adolf hitler gets the same as random joe non-christian that's not the case every single judgment passage in the bible john 5 romans 2 matthew 25 revelation 21 over and over and over again here's what it says i open up a book and i figure out what you did what did you do what did you do what did you do and then you have these passages where jesus goes that city is going to suffer more than that city yeah. That city's going to suffer more than that city. Oh, I wish you were like them because you wouldn't have suffered as much as I don't think hell is one, uh, you know, just kind equal. of concept equal. And I don't think heaven's like that either, by the way. Yeah, oh, I don't think it's one big totally Apple different. store where we're just walking around, 100%. you know, in sheets going, you know, whatever. I think, I think it's going to be level of reality. I, uh, they, and, they, and anyway, that's another Jesus conversation. Jesus seems to speak that way. But why, so I think, I think that's true, but why is the gospel, why is the gospel good news then in, in the light well, the gospel of... is the sense that Jesus took hell for us yeah. so that we wouldn't have to take it. Yeah. That every, every concept of judgment, this is, you know, this is John 3, where the wrath of God remains on you if you don't believe. But if you believe, then the wrath goes to him right. and you're standing behind this rock, you know. Yeah. So in the sense, he took the hell, the, yes. the emotional, the, all of it on himself. Spiritual, physical. Um, and it would have felt so much more like hell to him because, you know, as one writer said, even for the incarnation to be true, it's like, it's like us becoming a slug or a crab. Yeah. He lived in such pleasure and delight and glorification that when he becomes a human being, it'd be like us becoming a snail for 40. Like, and not only for 40, actually. There's great theologians that talk about the fact that his, his sacrifice is often talks, not talked about. His sacrifice is actually forever. He is forever a human being. When you see him, he... he he's glorified uh, he, as he, a human. He's a glor yeah. in a glorified state. But yeah. when he decided to limit himself, he, there was something about it where he had, the limitation was eternal. Yeah. It wasn't just for 30 years and then he went back to exactly what he was doing before. Yeah. It's, it's, he went back to a glory as he talked about John 17, but it's different. When Revelation 5 says like the worship the worship in eternity actually surrounds the lamb who was slain, right? Like yeah, what? which is a beautiful thing coming back to the evil and suffering because in Christianity, you have the one concept where God actually came and suffered for you. Yeah. And you know that the answer isn't that he didn't care because he actually entered in yeah. and took the wrath for you and suffered, and which is, you know, obviously a terrible reality, but one that goes, okay, no other concept of God is this the case. The Christian idea of, of the gift of grace through, through Jesus yeah. Christ, received by faith, is completely unlike any other, any other ideology yeah. in the marketplace of ideas. Yeah. 100%. All right, let's, we got like six minutes left. So anybody have a question? Oh, we got lots of questions. All right, all right, all right. Let's go back here. Walk, walk down there. You know, uh, come on up. Come on up. Oh, everyone wants to see your face. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You didn't even eat one, did you? You I faked did, it. I did. I ate this you one. You faked it. I almost it. fainted. You faked it. All right. All right. What's your question? And then based on the question, I'll, I'll decide what, what wing to give you. Uh, I just wanted to ask your thoughts on um, mental illness, because uh, that's a huge topic. And just, what you're, just in general, what your thoughts are and, and uh, just how we can minister to people yeah. with those experiences. For sure. Try that one right there. Oh. That's third hottest. <laughs> it's good. It's tasty. Try it. Yeah, just take a bite and let's see. Oh, it's here. Put that. If you can eat the whole thing, it's tasty. Is it hot? You can take it. All right. A little hot. Um, Is it picking up? All right. Enjoy. Yeah, put really good question. Put the bone in your really pocket. Really good question, bro. Um, so, obviously, a massive issue. Uh, and uh, I personally, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, maybe tonight and tomorrow, but uh, I personally deal with it myself. I, when my. Uh, my parents got divorced. I got Tourette's syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder as a nine-year-old kid and uh, have dealt with it ever since, which is why I tweak my face around and do weird things on stage with my body. I kind of constantly, which isn't, you know, anyway, I'll talk about how it impacts my, you know, actual ministry and life. Um, so it's something I've dealt with uh, myself. And um, I think the church needs to be able to uh, obviously love and come alongside them and be able to call a spade a spade and not just 
over spiritualize everything. Um, I had a woman, I spoke in, uh, I won't even tell you where, I spoke somewhere a month or so ago, and as I was preaching, I talked about my Tourette's as an illustration, and I talk about it um, in a way where God gets glorified, and so, and this woman sends me this message, and she said, you know, uh, when you were nine or 10 years old, that's when a demon entered you, and if you would come see me, you would never have to deal with this again in your life, because it's all just demonic. Um, I, I, I don't believe that. I think that's a very dangerous philosophy to run your life on. Uh, I have a friend who, who's a word faith guy and he believes that, um, you know, uh, he, like it, we'll be talking and I'll say, you know, so-and-so got cancer and he'll say, you can't say that word in my house. That word has power. And I'm like, okay, uh, we've just, we've just left the, the harbor at that point. Um, and so, um, I think that we, I think we over spiritualize these things and we tell people, well, just get more of Jesus in your life and your, you know, uh, hardcore depression and suicidal thoughts and bipolar will just go away. You don't need to go to a doctor, you know, and then there's all these sermons and the doctor's the enemy. Oh, the doctor told me I had this, but he wasn't right. And everyone's woohoo. And it's like, yeah, but he was right 99% of the other times when my parents died of cancer he was right then right so it's like uh, i think we have to be very careful yeah uh to make this dichotomy of christians versus the medical you know whatever i think christians so it's very you have to be very careful they need to see you know whether it's healing healing is healing and the body's the body and, and yeah. mental illness is illness yeah and we wouldn't we wouldn't like right. begrudge a person who has a broken arm. We could pray for the healing. Right. Why would you heal the arm? What's wrong with you? If it doesn't happen. Yeah. Like, oh, ye of little faith. Right. Like, no, when did that... a demon enter that arm? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I think it's very dangerous on the one hand. On the other hand, I think through a lot of great, you know, prayer and fasting. And I, I think that, I, I mean, it's a huge conversation. I think, the, I think the mind is so powerful. This, I mean, this is a whole other talk, but the, there's a great, there's a book called The God-Shaped Brain. For those of you who are interested in this kind of stuff, you should go read it. It's amazing. It's by a medical doctor who talks about the power of the brain and talks about the, actually a concept of um, the big thesis of the book is the concept of love versus the concept of judgment. When, and when somebody actually has as priority a concept of God as judge, they actually function different in life than if the overwhelming concept is a God of love. He's actually wired their brains up to predict these things and see the chemical responses in their brains. Because, of course, you get, you know, highways in your brain get carved out uh, through certain activities. And so uh, the book opens with a story about a guy who goes to the doctor and he's sick, he's dying. And they're like, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? And he finally confesses. He's like, I'm been dealing with this for a month. Uh, my health has declined. And the doctor finally says, what happened? What happened? What happened? They can't figure out what they're doing. The guy's days away from dying. His family's in there crying. And uh, finally, the guy calls the doctor. Over. He's like, I got to tell you something. I don't want my family to know. The other day, I went to uh, a witch. And she cast a spell over me. And she put a, a frog inside of my stomach. And the, and the frog is killing me. And that's why you can't heal me. And the doctor goes, oh, I know what to do. And so he goes out to the pond that sits in front of the hospital and he pulls a frog out and he walks into the room and he says, okay, everyone, I'm going to do a procedure right now. I figured out what the problem is. And he puts a little numbing stuff on the guy's stomach. He pretends to cut his stomach open and pulls a frog and puts it in a bag, lifts it up in front of the guy's face and goes, I got the frog out. Four days later, that guy walks into the hospital. Mind. Powerful. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, the brain is this massive... But it's, my point is, it's complex. Yeah. And so, of course, it's prayer. Of course, it's spiritual. But it's also emotional. It's also psychological. It's also based on the trauma that you went through and that you're going through. It's also based on getting the right medicine. You know, I've watched staff members deal with bipolar and depression and watch them go from uh, dysfunction to be able to get on proper pills after a proper counseling and, and be functional. Again. All of that stuff. So I think, uh, anyway, I don't think the church does a great job at it, partly because we over-spiritualize it at times. We ignore it. But with the rise of suicide among almost every single demographic inside and outside the church, uh, it's very scary. And I think the church needs to figure out a way to deal with it well. Yeah. I mean, the gospel, I mean, again, it, to come back to the gospel, though, um, there obviously there's, there's common grace. There are doctors. There are medications. And that's, that needs to be okay. Uh, at the same time, though, I mean, you've, you've seen the power of the mind and, the, and God's ability to renew it and change it. I mean, you got, like... I'm sure you'll, you'll hit maybe some of this sometime this weekend, but like you've come a long way in your struggle with your mental illness. Like you've seen that. Yeah. God's grace is amazing. And the power of the Holy spirit, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the yeah. same spirit that's alive in us. 
Um, there's a beautiful reality and a lot of healing. We do, uh, you, you talk about Celebrate Recovery, we do something called Freedom Session. The yeah. guy started, actually works at our church. The crazy stuff that comes out of that uh, yeah. with mental, physical, emotional stuff, uh, it's honestly unreal, yeah. the kind of healing that can happen. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. the, the fact that you're able to do what you do, though, I mean, is testimony to... Yeah, that's power. just all God. Yeah, yep. it's, it's totally, crazy. 100%. I think the point is, we need to wrap up. The, yep. po- the point is, you know, you bring, you bring like, like all your cares to the Lord. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes he does. He, we've seen it in our church. Sometimes he touches people and there's literally like yep. supernatural healing. Yep. Other times he's, he gives his healing through a doctor. We have all kinds of, yep. of faith-filled physicians here. And sometimes he says, my grace is sufficient. And you're going to walk with the wound, and you're going to walk with the limp, and it's going to bring me glory. Yep. So, that's awesome. You guys, thank, thank Mark Clark. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much. Appreciate hey, it. Really- hey, guys. Thank you so much for listening today. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Pastor Brent Ingersoll with Pastor Mark Clark from Village Church. Again, his book is The Problem of God. You can find it at bookstores and Amazon and all those places. Definitely worth your time. Definitely worth a read. I've read it. One of my favorite books on apologetics. If you haven't... You should definitely do that if you worth your time. And we wanted to say thank you to you, our listeners, as well. Hey, if you're watching, if you're a video person on YouTube, man, that's awesome. Subscribe to our channel so you know when we upload our next episode. If you're listening in iTunes, make sure you subscribe to our podcast feed there as well. You'll get a notification when we post our next episode, episode 7, which is going to be dropping in just a few weeks this summer. You're not going to want to miss it. We think it's going to be really special. So we'll see you guys soon. Thanks for listening. This has been The Trending Podcast.